Hi, everybody, and thank you for being here. I'm Florian. I work at Epos Dev, that's the guys with the lanyards. And I've been a developer and I've been at Ops for 15 years now. And first, I want to apologize for ev to everybody who came for the long list of trade offs. It's actually just three. Uh, it's three conceptual trade offs I gather are quite important when you're entering microservices. And um, something first. The alternative to microservices is not the monolith. The alternative to microservices is, is just bigger services. And this is the trade-off I'm, I'm talking about. But um, a word of warning before that. Um, you probably know the concept of survivorship bias. It's the you only hear about the success story thing. Uh, the people who are boasting their successes in microservice migrations are the ones who actually succeeded. You will never hear about the guys who failed miserably, but there are quite a lot of them. And I want to keep that in mind when you hear all the success stories. There are probably more stories uh, which did not succeed. So the first trade-off I want to talk about is application performance. In the old times, we had application performance by having big iron. We, have, we had vast machines, mainframes, and that stuff. The, the new world is uh, off-the-shelf hardware, uh, clusters of machines. And the reasoning, one of the reasons uh, behind that, is cost. So at a certain scale, you just cannot just buy more big iron because it's getting too expensive, or at some point, there is nothing to buy when you have Facebook scale. There's no computers that have all um, the performance that Facebook needs. So there's, there's more requirements, but let's focus on, on cost first. Um, but the apparent cheapness of clusters of off-the-shelf hardware is, is a myth. So uh, this is from the the fallacies of distributed systems, one of these fallacies is that latency is zero. And uh, you don't have that in a distri distributed system, and you don't have that in a microservices architecture. Uh, these are the times it takes for a memory reference, a local memory reference in the CPU. It's mm, not on the chart, it's just too small. Um, sending something about a gigabit network is, um, is a bit longer, and a data center round trip is vastly longer than having a local memory reference. So uh, we're paying with latency when we do microservices and we, we do a, a vastly distributed infrastructure. And against that, we use caching aggressively on multiple layers to not have delays. We do uh, eventual consistency for availability because we have uh, more machines now. And I think a point many people are missing is that this is not just a technical problem. This is um, a service design and user experience problem. You have to solve a user-facing problem with your microservices or whatever architecture. And um, let me give an example from travel bookings. Um, Many of you probably know these horrible travel booking websites where you book a flight and a hotel and a car, and um, when you when you go go book your your travels, uh, it's a distributed system. Uh, your front end looks up uh, flights or cars or hotel rooms in in several other services, and you get these these ugly spinning wheels, and it takes forever to to get back an answer. And this is the kind of user-facing UX decisions that you're facing when you have, have microservices. It just gets worse when you have lots of these services. All the interfaces you have face these, these issues with, with latency. You have to think about how that appears to the user, because at the end of the day, that's why we're building these architectures. Um, if you want to 
go a bit deeper into that topic, I think uh, Stefan Hilkov is talking about that tomorrow at 9 downstairs. So he's going to talk a bit about user experience and microservices. The second trade-off is complexity. And in the old times, we had the complexity contained in the applications we wrote. And we have good tooling for that. Um, when we're moving into distributed systems and extremely distributed systems with microservices, we move a lot of these, com uh, these complexities into the infrastructure. But why are we doing that? We have good tools for structuring applications. We have patterns. We have architectures for that. We don't have as much support for doing that in a distributed way. That's all quite new and not very mature. Also, there's lots of plumbing involved. You, you have to do things over and over again with your, with your old larger service. You have to have a build pipeline, you have to have a testing concept, you have to have deployment and stuff. And now you have that all over the place. You're trading an economy of scope where you had efficiencies because everything was centralized for an economy of scale where you spread out all the things, which does not work that well. We, we don't have the concepts yet to just throw around hundreds or dozens at least of build chains testing and synchronizing all that. So this is um, a trade-off you have to willingly make. But this can all be fixed. Uh, Russell Miles is going to talk about that tomorrow also, I think, about the, the technical challenges in, in microservices. But I think there's one big problem, one complexity you cannot really get rid of. And this is also one of the distributed systems fallacies, which is the network is secure. No, it's not, especially when you're running in a public cloud. And um, in, in the old days, it probably was enough to just protect your edge services, the, the ones facing the public internet. But now you're running on public clouds. Your, your network is not that private anymore. And you probably have to have a measure for defense in depth. It's just not enough to do authentication at your firewall on the edge. You probably have to have authentication for services against each other, and you have to know what, on behalf of what user that request is traversing your, uh, your platform. Which means you probably need a PKI or a secret store. And this is a largely, largely unsolved problem. There's some players in that field. There's um, KeyWiz by... Uh, by Square and there's Walt by HashiCorp. They do just secret storage and they do auditing for, for secret access. But at the end of the day, you have to authenticate the applications accessing the secret stores. So you have kind of a, a chicken-egg problem. You have to solve the initial trust problem. You have lots of ephemeral services in your, uh, in your platform and you, you have to roll keys, you have to probably hand out certificates, lots of them, and you have to expire them and all that. And there's lots of tooling involved, and I don't think there's a good solution for that right now. So this is a, a serious trade-off. What was manageable for a couple of services, like key management and secrets and uh, distributing certificates, becomes quite impossible for a microservices infrastructure. And the last trade-off I want to talk about is development velocity and how, how we achieve that. With more centralized services, we achieve velocity through shared infrastructure, through, through shared technologies. Everybody knows uh, all the stuff that's going on. And um, you have a relatively efficient operation. When you go to distributed services, 
you hope that scale will solve your problems. So you have more effort, you have um, more plumbing for, for all your services, but when you have independent teams working uh, next to each other, independently, nobody stepping on others' toes, um, you gain at scale because you can evolve your platform independently and you can walk on that corner and you can walk on that corner and everything goes pretty fast. So we have all these lanes. You, you have lanes for services that go live every five minutes. You have continuous delivery of, of your services uh, and we have a very efficient delivery pipeline. But there is something that's holding you back and that may destroy all your velocity, and that's integration testing. Uh, at least the end-to-end system-level kind of, of things, because that's usually slow. It's usually brittle, and if you have slow tests, you're, you're testing against a moving target. If you have all these services next to each other who talk to each other and um, evolve independently, and you should do something ab about that in your testing strategy, because otherwise you may lose all the benefits you have by using microservices for faster evolution. And one approach to that, it's also quite new, is uh, contract-based testing. So what you, what you do is you take the, the testing pyramid and make the number of integration tests that you need very, very small, because that's the stuff that's killing your velocity. And what you do instead is replace them with contracts between your services. Uh, we had that in the, in the talks before that, but I will uh, walk you through the concept very quick. Um, you have a service with multiple consumers in your, in your system, and all these consumers, they formulate in code a contract of which, in this case, attributes of a call against that service they're actually using. And uh, you see, not all the consumers use the same attributes. Um, some attributes are used uh, uh, by two services, and yeah, so you, you have um, only a partial coverage of that whole, whole API. And this can be used for service evolution. You could say, okay, we guarantee backwards compatibility with all the services, and uh, there's no way everybody makes breaking, anybody makes breaking changes, but that limits your ability to evolve your services. So basically, you have to keep all the old APIs around forever. And if you want to have a pattern for evolution, you have to have a safe way to move forward. And all the consumers, they code a contract of what they're using from the service, and they give that to the team that de uh, develops the service, and that's ex executable, and they can run these contracts every time they make changes in the service, and they see if anything breaks. And if anything breaks, they go and talk to the consumers. So it's a communication pattern. It's will not magically solve all your compatibility problems, but it's a pattern to get into a conversation about how to solve that. Uh, the nice case in uh, these consumer-driven contracts is that also having these contracts gives the service um, a unit-level test against the API, which is quite fast, and it also gives the consumers a mock instance of the service, which they can use in, at component-level tests, which is also quite fast. But, as I said, this is still a very young field, and there's a lot of issues involved in synchronizing these contracts when someone updates their consumer or their service, and uh, also, uh, consumers have a means to make the service tests go red, because when the consumers change their contracts, uh, the service tests may go red, and that's an issue you, you may be facing. Um, that's for testing. To recap, first I talked about the, the business issues of microservices. So, microservices are not only 
a technical issue, it's a business issue. It has to be driven by business and user experience concerns. Keep that in mind which, with everything you do with microservices. Second, um, make sure that you know the trade-off in security you're making uh, or go the hard way and try to make your microservices infrastructure as secure as the old infrastructure was. And third, um, to gain high-velocity development at high quality, you probably have to adapt your testing strategy at one point. I have one more thing, and it's a reminder that the DDD book came out in 2003, and it has this bounded context we're all talking about in it. But microservices as, as a concept is much younger, from 2012. Some people say from 2005, but anyway, it's younger. And we could do bounded contacts, uh, contacts in traditional big services. And with that, I will leave you and thank you for your attention. I think we have, we have time for questions, yeah, do we? So are these are these the only um, you, you um, alluded to? Like you thought uh, said uh, there were more challenges than that. Or like you know, can you list a few more? Uh, <laughs> um, not some which I have uh, good data on. Uh, that it, it varies from context to context, probably. So um, the context I'm coming from is. Um, a tightly regulated one, so security is very important for us, and just this boundary checking at, at your edge services is definitely not enough for, for auditing reasons. And so, but uh, the, the main challenges will change with the context you're, you're in, I think. There's, there's lots with small tooling issues, uh, but you will have, I think that's technical details. So I was going for the, the big conceptual ones. Uh, there are lots of small issues inside these. And it's not an easy migration, I think, for nobody to, to go to a microservices or just a smaller services architecture. Hi. Um, hey. I think it comes down a bit to how micro the service should be. So in, um, what are you talking about? Which size of services or how many services? Um, yeah, because it, you're talking about like some bigger services. Just interesting. Uh, yeah, so uh, I said it, these are all trade-offs and uh, there's a continuity. Uh, uh, continuum. You have, when you have single big services, you're on, on one end, you don't have the security problem. And these problems usually scale with the size of the services, or the number of the services especially. Uh, um, certificate management and trust management becomes much more difficult when you have like a thousand machines. When you only have four, that's quite easy. And uh, I don't think there's an answer to which size are we going for. It's, depends on the context. It's, it depends on your business, what you need. So also, this latency stuff, it becomes more extreme when you go to big numbers of services. Just asking again, like in your context, how many services have you? Yeah. <laughs> so 
<laughs> there are some limitations we have. It's like we have 255 IP addresses. We have t three stages. Every service facing externally has an external SSL certificate. So if one of the teams decides to have another service facing, we need to make sure is it the mobile content? Does the service know server side? Um, so are there old devices on it, like Android, and they need a dedicated IP, so we're losing three new, new IPs? And we have like the old world with the um, big application and the new world, so we are moving from the old services to the new services. Like I need to ask all the teams that say, I need a new service, are you sure you need a new virtual machine? I sure you need a new external port? Because many of them don't know that they can just use rewrite rules to use like more services through one channel. But we are really wasting a lot of resources on like the virtual machines we're deploying, on the um, whole concept of duplicating stuff. If another team comes, it takes like six to ten virtual machines we have to manage again. But to, to answer your, your question simply, I think it's about 80 services we have right now in, in our context. So I don't really understand your argument about uh, having so many machines because I think this is more a scalability issue than an issue of how many services you have, because um, with containers you can also run 100 services on one machine, and if you have a million of customers, you need thousands of machines, uh, potentially, even if you have only one service. But so so uh, that you have to manage many machines, that is more a matter of scale than a matter of the number of services you use. No, it's not. Uh, uh, so. Um the, the issues uh, Stefan was, was talking about uh, probably is, but, but these issues are directly related to the number of services. It's not really related to the number of nodes you have, because for, or maybe, maybe the latency one is. Yeah? If, you, uh, if you have uh, stuff that communicates over the network, you, you have latency and you have to deal for that. Uh, the, the security argument, is also about nodes. So if every service has to have an identity, you scale that with the number of services you have and also of the service instances you have, because every service instance probably has a, a unique identity. For the testing stuff, that only has to do with the number of services you have, because you, you just have to, to check API compatibility. But uh, that all moves with moves at scale, so some, some scale uh, with the nodes, some scale with the services you have. But, but I think they are conceptual problems which you cannot easily solve. So tooling will help you, but it will not make these problems go away, I think. But we can talk, talk later about that. Thanks, everybody.